I'm fired up, I tell you what, right now. Fired up. I tell you, we searched the internet for a long time to find that last cowboy play, I'll tell you that. I said, we got to put one good cowboy play in there. And they said, that's impossible, Todd. I, don't know. I think we found that one from the 1960s right there. I don't know what to tell you. I am so glad that you are here with us today in the room, all the multi-site campuses. Also thankful for those on the TV and on the stream. We are beginning a brand new series called Get In the game and our hope is that we would get off the sidelines and we would get in the game and we'd actually run a play for Jesus. So let's get into the message today. Just out of curiosity, by a raise of the hands, how many of you been on a picnic? Just out of curiosity, just put your hands up. How many of you wanted to go on the picnic? That's a real question. How many endured the picnic? That's what, yeah, every guy would have his hand up for enduring the picnic. Having a picnic isn't an unusual thing, but where you have the picnic can be quite Unusual. Max Lucado writes in 1861, the people of Washington, D.C. decided to have a picnic up on a hill as they overlooked a battlefield with an actual battle going on. Yes, friends, you heard me right. Soldiers were shooting their bullets. Cannons were shooting off as well. And these people were laying out their picnic blankets, asking people to pass them fried chicken, coleslaw, and some potato salad. Soldiers being killed right in front of them. The London Times reported on this. The writer wrote, the spectators were all excited and a lady with opera glasses was quite beside herself at the sound of the cannons. She said, this is splendid. Oh my, isn't this first rate? People were dying down in the hillside down below. And they're eating potato salad as they watch this. Of course, what they thought was just going to be a little bit of a skirmish turned out to be an all-out battle. And all of a sudden, the soldiers began to retreat. And guess where they retreated? Right where all the picnickers were. Now there were bullets Flying by their heads, dads grabbed their children, husbands grabbed their wives. They ran to their wagons, got on their horses, and got out of there as quickly as they could. Many of them were trampled underfoot by the soldiers that were retreating. Now, you got to think about a story like that. You think, man, those people had stupid written across their forehead. How can you be so dumb? I think it's safe to say that's the last time in the history of mankind that someone went and had a picnic by a battlefield. Or was it? Could it be that we are doing the exact same thing? Friends, we are in a spiritual warfare. And your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And Jesus said he's a thief. And he's come to steal, kill, and destroy you. And what has the church done? We've laid out a picnic. Pass me a piece of fried chicken. Oh, I'd like another scoop of that coleslaw. Oh, delicioso. Now, we know that we've won the ultimate victory, haven't we? Jesus won the ultimate victory on the cross when he died for the sins of all mankind and rose again from the dead. We're fighting from a victory, but there are still battles that have to be fought. But victory is inevitable. The Bible says in Romans 16, verse 20, that the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Friends, I want you to know something. This is going to happen. And you know why it's going to happen? It's because nothing can stop God. No government can stop the plans of God. No person can stop the plans of God. No persecution can stop the plans of God. And God has invited us, the church, to be a part of this amazing plan of redemption for all of mankind. And you do understand, don't you, that the church is not these buildings. The church is you. You are the hands and the feet of Jesus So in this new series called Get in the Game, we're going to paint a picture of what the church could be, of what the church should be, about every person taking individual responsibility for their part on the team and advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ and kicking down the very gates of hell. We're going to look at a passage in Matthew chapter 16, and Jesus is going to paint a picture of the kind of church that he's come to create, the kind of followers that he wants to have. Now, it's interesting 
Jesus travels with his disciples 25 miles to get to Caesarea Philippi to have this conversation where he's going to ask them two questions. Now listen, the disciples don't want to go to Caesarea Philippi, and there was a good reason for that. This was a pagan area. These people didn't care about worshiping the one true God. All they cared about was sex and pleasure, and whatever they wanted to do was what they wanted to do. Listen, if the people of Caesarea Philippi had a motto, it would be, whatever happens in Caesarea Philippi stays in Caesarea Philippi. This was also a place of idol worship. There was a temple there called the Temple of Pan where they worshipped the god Pan. So I just imagine Jesus sitting out there on the grassy knoll with his disciples and this is the backdrop of this false god that people are coming to to bow down before and to worship. And the Temple of Pan was a godless place. They had temple prostitution, both male and female, that would do whatever you wanted them to do. And whatever you did with them was worshiping your false god. This was a place of bestiality. This was a place of infant sacrifice. So Jesus has them walk 25 miles to sit down right in front of the Temple of Pan to ask them these questions. Now you notice in the picture just off to the left there's a cave. Do you know what's in the cave? There's a spring. The people tried to figure out how deep the spring was. They never could find the bottom of the spring. You know what they called that? They called that the gates of Hades. This is where they believed that Satan descended and ascended to do his bidding. That this is where the demons would descend and ascend to do his bidding. So it's with this as the backdrop that Jesus asked the question. Same questions I'd ask you. He asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? Now, they could have gone a lot of different directions with this one, couldn't they? They could have said, well, some say you're a drunk and a glutton. Because that was kind of the rumor about Jesus, because he hung around with sinners and he partied with them. So, so I saw some people think you drink a little too much. Some people think you eat a little too much. Jesus. That's what people are talking about right there. They could have said that. They could have said, well, some people think you're cray-cray, you know? Some people think you're a few fries short of a happy meal. Some people think your driveway doesn't make it all the way down to the street. You understand what I'm saying? Some people might be saying that about you, Jesus, because of all the boisterous claims that you're making about being God in the flesh. But they don't go that direction. They're smarter than that. Who do people say that I am? One of the disciples spoke up and said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Now, some of you know who John the Baptist was. Some of you don't. John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus. He was the forerunner for Jesus, the forerunner of the Messiah. John the Baptist was the kind of guy who would just tell it like it was. And so when King Herod Antipas took his brother's wife Herodias as his own, John the Baptist called him out for the sin that it was. And Herodias didn't appreciate that at all. Well, there was a party one night, and Herodias' daughter began to dance for the king. And he was so pleased by the dance that he said to the little girl, Hey, I'll give you whatever you want up to half the kingdom." She ran over to her mom and she said, what should I ask for? And she said, tell him that you want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So John the Baptist was beheaded. So when the disciples say, well, some say you're John the Baptist, what they're basically saying is that many people believe the spirit of John the Baptist has entered into you. Still another disciple spoke up and said, well, some say you're Elijah. Elijah was a prophet in the Old Testament. Many people believe that he would come back. He would make way for the Messiah. So they're saying, listen, Jesus, you're not the Messiah. Many people are saying that you're not the Messiah, but you're the one who's going to make way for the Messiah. Still others say that you're a prophet. And then Jesus asked the ultimate question, the same question he asked us today. Who do you say that I am? Now, you're sitting there in front of the Temple of Pan. You're just feet away from the gates of hell itself. Could you think of a more intimidating position to answer this question? And I don't know how long it took the disciples to answer it. I don't know if they looked around and kind of kicked rocks for a little bit. But I do know this. Peter stepped up and he said this. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that word Christ is a title. It's not his last name. A lot of people think that's his last name. What's Jesus' last name? It's Christ. It's not It's not. It's a title. It means anointed one. It means the Messiah. So I want you to look at Jesus' response to Peter. He said, I tell you that you're Peter. And on this rock I'll build my church. And the gates of Hades 
will not overcome it. Do you understand what Jesus is saying here? He's saying, I'm not going to build my church in the safe confines of Jerusalem. I'm building my church right outside the gates of hell itself. My church will care about people that nobody else cares about. My church will go to places that nobody else has the guts or the courage to go to. My church will advance. My church will kick down the gates of hell. Have you ever thought about gates before? Gates are not offensive weapons, are they? We, we, we set gates up to protect territory, to protect property. You say, this is my property. Don't come over my gate. You never get into a fight and say, hang on a second. Before I fight you, I got to get my gate. You've never said that one time in your life. No, I'm going to get you with my gate. That's what I'm going to do. Gates are defensive. So what's Jesus painting a picture of? A church that's on the offensive. A church that kicks down the gates of hell. A church that advances. A church that moves beyond the four walls and actually does what the word of God says that we're supposed to be about. A triumphant church. A church that looks different from anything else that society has to offer. A church that has the guts to go past the gates of hell and rescue those who are perishing and rescue those who are dying. Let me ask you a question. Do you know very many churches like that? Because there's not very many churches that are on the offensive. Too many churches are playing defense. But we're supposed to run a play. It's playoff time. So let me talk to my Dallas Cowboy fans for just a second. <laughs> you know I love you. I love you. I'm rooting for you today. I'm rooting for you. Nothing but love. <laughs> Let's say you decide to go to the game today. You buy a high price ticket because they're very expensive. And then you get there and you don't realize that parking is not included, so you pay another 200 bucks for that. Then you get in there and you're so fired up. I mean, there is a spirit of anticipation. There's excitement all around you. You can't wait to see your team play. And so you're right there on the 50-yard line. I mean, you've spent every dime you've got to come to this game. And you're sitting there and now it's time for the coin toss and your team loses the coin toss and so they, they're going to kick the ball off to you. Well, it goes through the end zone, so you're going to start on the 25-yard line. So your team comes running out onto the field, and you're like, yeah, come on. <laughs> Cowboys, let's go. You about pass out, right? That's what you do. So I about passed out right now, I'll tell you that right now. Got a little too fired up for your team. That's what happened just then. <laughs> so they get in their huddle. And you know the clock counts down. You only have so much time to make it to the line of scrimmage and run a play. Well, something's, something's not right. It's the Cowboys, okay? <laughs> and so the ref throws the flag and says, five-yard penalty, delay a game. So you go back five yards. And you think, All right, come on, guys, let's go. And they huddle up again. And they're taking too much time in the huddle. And the flag is thrown again. And they back up another five yards. Now you're a Dallas Cowboy football fan. You're going to look at your team and go, man, I'm so proud of them right now. I mean, that's, that's the best looking huddle I've ever seen in my entire life. Look at my team huddle. Oh, man, my team can huddle. I think that's almost a complete circle right there. I think that is. Look at them holding hands in their huddle. Oh, the huddle. I love the huddle. Would you be saying that? No, you'd be saying some other things, wouldn't you? You'd have to come to church and repent the next week. That's what you'd be saying. You're like, come on. Run a play. Because you didn't spend all that money to watch them huddle. Why just think about Jesus? I wonder if he looks at us and says, I didn't die on the cross and rise again from the dead so you could huddle. Boy, we have a great huddle here, don't we? We got great music, we got great videos. Huh. 
good looking preacher. I mean, come on. <laughs> we got it going on. Got a great huddle. And the QB, just call me Dak. Just call me Dak. Dak Prescott. I come in with the play. See, this is what the Lord wants us to do. We get in our huddle. We say, Amen. We run in these plays. Are we just huddling? I already know the answer. 30% of us give to this church. And I've told you that before. And we're no need financially. I've told you that before. Faithful people keep this church going forward. But have you ever thought, if we all got on board, what we could accomplish? 30% of our people serve in a ministry. The other 70%, they opt out. Oh, we know that Jesus came to serve, not be served. Give his life, it's a ransom for many. But we don't follow in the footsteps of Jesus, even though he's called us to do it. There's just certain plays... We refuse to run. We don't share our faith in Jesus. How long has it been since you had a spiritual conversation with somebody? And how long has it been since you cared about someone's eternity enough to invite them to church? I'm going to be really honest with you. We've got campuses in the state of New Mexico. Some of those campuses run five, six, seven hundred people. Do you know what's possible for them to come, those five, six, seven hundred people, to that particular campus on a weekend and listen to the play and never bring anybody with them? How is that possible that so many people can come to church week after week after week after week after week and so care so little for those who are lost For those who are far from God, that they never even say, hey, come with me to church and afterwards I'll take you out for lunch. I care about you, man. And there's stuff going on at my church that I'd love for you to be about. Now, how long has it been since you've even had that conversation? How long has it been since someone sat down next to you that you brought? My goodness, when we see all the empty seats that are around us, doesn't it make you a little bit offended? Don't you think about that family member, that friend that that you could have brought, that could have made an eternal impact in their life? No, we just sit around and we huddle and we say amen and we, we applaud, don't we? Oh man, we love to applaud. Did that best of, best of showed all these statistics and we, oh yeah, that's my church. Look at what my church did. Did you do it? Or are you just over in the bleachers cheering the 30% who's in the game. And don't you long for something more? For so many of us, church is just an hour obligation thing. You know, that's all it is. You do your spiritual time and then you go live the way you want to live. And, and you're not the church. You just attend the church. And that's why you're empty. You, you, you look at this world and you say, I'm going to hell in a handbasket. Well, we're the reason why it has. We're not doing the things that Jesus asked us to do. And have you ever imagined that if we ever got it right, what we could accomplish? What we could do? You say, Todd, you're absolutely right. I need to get in the game. What are these plays that you're talking about? Well, if you'll come over the course of this series, I'm going to explain each and every one of them. And this could be the greatest year of this church. You know When I started this thing almost 25 years ago, I envisioned something so beautiful and so awesome. I envisioned this move of God. And I just think that God's got more. God's got more that he wants to accomplish in us. You say, well, what's the play? Well, I'll give you the first one. We believe that God is intimately concerned about each individual lost person and therefore reaching them as a priority of our church. I want you to understand that this church exists to reach one more person for Jesus Christ. Period. We exist to know Christ and to make Christ known. Where do we get that from? We get it from Jesus. That's all he cared about, right? That's, he, he sought after those who were lost, who were far from God, and he warned people about what would happen if they turned away from him. 
that they would spend their eternity separated from him. See, around here we understand that there really is a heaven, there really is a hell, and people really are going to one place or the other. And so our job is to kick down the gates of hell and rescue one more person for Jesus Christ. And it's not for 10% of us, it's for every single one of us. Jesus told a story one time about two guys who died. You remember the story? There was a rich man who died and a poor man, a beggar by the name of Lazarus who died on the same day. Lazarus, because he loved God, went to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man went to hell. And he's in torment in the flames and he calls out to Lazarus who's at the bosom of Abraham. And this is what he says. I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so they'll not also come to this place of torment. He's not saying, oh, I'm having a great time. Oh, this is wonderful. This is everything I dream. I can't wait for my brothers to get here. He says, you got to warn them. you got to send somebody to them. Do you remember when Jesus was dying on the cross between two thieves? And both thieves ridiculed Jesus. They laughed at Jesus. They cursed Jesus. And then somewhere during that crucifixion, one of the thieves came to their senses and realized that Jesus truly was the Son of God. How do we know that? Because he looks at Jesus and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What kingdom is Jesus coming into? He's dying. It's a tremendous statement of faith. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. One more person, even to his dying breath, he was reaching out to one more person. So here's a question I have for you. Can you have a spiritual conversation with somebody? Do you know what to say? I mean, my goodness, if somebody came to you and said, hey, why do you go to church? Or what's the difference that Jesus makes in somebody's life? Could you give them the goods? Could you explain to them how they could give their life to Jesus Christ as well? Most of our church cannot do it. And this has been a burden for me. So I wrote a four-week seminar on how to share your faith. We're doing these things called core classes this year. And our hope is that the church, that's you, would step up and learn these plays and then go out and live these plays. Now all you got to do is go to the Sagebrush app, scroll over one time at the top banner. The first banner says 2023. Just scroll over one time, it says core classes, hit on that, and then you can register for this. You say, why would I do that? Well, it's your mom. It's your dad. It's your brother. It's your sister. It's your coworker. It's your friend. That if you don't learn this, they're going to go to hell. Do we understand that? You know what Jesus one day said? He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. People are more more open to the things of God than they've ever been before. Why? Because our world's nuts. And people are looking for hope. They're looking for stability. And you know things they don't know. And so you have the opportunity to bring a light to a dark place. You have an opportunity to bring hope in a hopeless situation. You have the opportunity to explain that God so loved them that he gave his one and only son to die for them and rose again from the dead and wants to have a relationship with them, wants to do life together with them and spend forever with them in heaven. Friends, we have the best news, but it's not being shared. The harvest is plentiful at the workers. Just not very many of them. Why is that? Because so many people don't even understand why the church exists. 85% of people on an exit survey, when they're asked the question, why does the church exist? They said, to meet my needs. Not to reach people who are far from Jesus. Not to kick down the gates of hell. To meet my needs. We've become such narcissists, haven't we? It was a few years ago. I was talking to this nice lady. And and we were talking for for a little bit. And she said, "I, I recognize you. I said, you do? She said, yeah. She said, you're, you're Todd Cook. You're the pastor of Sagebrush, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. Do you go? She said, no. I said, oh. Have you ever gone? You ought to come sometime. It's really a great church. She said, I went once. I said, you did? When did you go? Went on Christmas Eve. It was packed. Oh, my goodness, it was packed. It was hard to find a seat. Traffic was crazy. Your church is just too big. 
I said, what kind of church are you looking for? Small one. Small church that meets all my needs. She said, right now I'm church shopping. Say that to a preacher, find out what happens. <laughs> I'm church shopping. I said, you know what, I, I, I want you to know, this is what I said to her. I said, I want you to know, I'm, I hope you find a small church. And I hope they let you in. <laughs> because if they do, that church is going to get a little bit bigger. And when you get to that small church that meets all your needs, when you finally get done with church shopping, I want you to pray that they don't let anybody else in those doors. Because then the parking lot's going to get crazy, and it's going to be hard to find a seat. I want you to pray that you never bring your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sister, your friends, your coworkers. You need to pray that God sends them all to hell. Now, she looked at me like you're looking at me right now, like, oh, what? You should have seen my wife. She's like, what? But you just get to a point where you're just sick of the stupidity. Come on. What's too big? Hell's too big. Hell's too big. I'd like to thank the 30% for clapping. You say, man, Todd, you're all over me. I'm all over me. I got to preach this five times. This is so convicting. It's been years since I brought somebody to this church. What is wrong with me? What is wrong with us? We have the best news. And we don't share it with anybody. Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. We're supposed to go because the harvest is plentiful. Oh, but the workers, oh, there are not very many of them. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to pray and ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the field. That word send out, that phrase send out means to eject. To send them out to a lost and dying world that has absolutely no hope apart from Jesus. So what are you going to do? We're going to clap. We're going to huddle. Are we going to do this one? We're going to actually run this play. You have a sagebrush out. You can open up your phone if you like, and you can go ahead and open it up. Let's see if we can crash the app just out of curiosity. Just go ahead. No, I'm serious. Go ahead. Open it up. Open it up. I want you to, I want you to debate this for just a second. Open up your phone. Even if you're not going to make a decision today, just do it. It might spur somebody else up and down your road to make a decision. You're watching from home? Open up the app and just ask yourself the question, what's God want me to do? Because on that app, just a little bit down, about midway through, there's a place for decisions. There's also a place that talks about serving in the church. What would God have you do? What is the next step? For some of you, it's the core classes, isn't it? So you would swipe that top banner and you'd hit core classes and you would sign up and say, I want to learn how to do this. Because I care about people and I want to be ready when the Holy Spirit gives me an opportunity to share Jesus with somebody else. For some of us, the decision you need to make is you need to go home and make a list of five people who are far from God, who are in your sphere of influence. And then you pray every single day for those five people. God, use me. Intersect my path with them. Give me spiritual opportunities to talk to them about the most important thing in life. Some of you need to give your life to Jesus because there really is a heaven. And friends, there really is a hell. And he came for you and he died for you and he rose again for you to have a relationship with you. And you know that he's the only one that can satisfy you. Some of you need to run the play and get baptized. You've put it off for so long. You hit the decision tab. You tell us what you want to do. How about serving a ministry? We don't have a waiting list in any ministry. Why? Because 30% of the people are doing 100% of the work. But what could we be? What could we be? You need to understand something about me. As long as there's breath in my body, I'm going to spur us on. If that means we have to start more campuses, then by golly, we will start more campuses. 
That means we send more money overseas to help our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ have permanent facilities. We will send more money overseas and we will advance the kingdom of God and we will kick down the gates of hell. If that means... If that means we got to bake some cookies from time to time, walk across the street and get to know our neighbor, by golly, we'll make them. If that means we get trained to share Jesus with somebody else, we'll go through the training. And if that means we need to be generous so that we can fund this thing in a way it's never been funded before, to do those things which we never dreamed we'd be able to do, then may we be the people who step up and say, the kingdom of God is more important than my own. You know what my prayer for you and for me is? Is that when we wake up in the morning, Satan says, oh crud. So-and-so's awake. We better keep our eye on this one. Because he's coming for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please, please disturb us to want something more than just attending this place Lord help us to be the church to live out your word and your truth to run a play and leave this world in better shape than the way we found it Lord may this church be different from every church I know of may we be distinctive may we be holy May we advance your kingdom. And may every single one of us get in the game. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.